Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll give everyone a chance to uh, log into the webinar and then we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar this morning. Today, we wanted to spend some time talking about contracts, specifically as they relate uh, to property situations. We know we have a lot of questions around leases that people are dealing with, but also talk about contracts in general. I think many people maybe now have heard the term force majeure, and uh, maybe you have some understanding of it. Uh, maybe uh, you don't, but uh, we'll spend some time talking about what that means as well. Before we get started, I wanna thank all of our streaming partners. So Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce, obviously the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce, Milford Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the Bridgeport Regional Business Council, who all stream our webinars. Um, also, all of our investors here at the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce, who allow us to put on programming like this as we go through the crisis. Uh, we appreciate their support. It's only with their support that we're able to put on this type of programming. So we have a great panel with us here uh, this morning. I'm going to introduce each of them individually, allow them uh, to say a few words, and then we'll take your questions. So if you have questions, you can start putting those into the chat or the Q&A box. Uh, I'm gonna start first with Jim Perito, a partner at Halloran Sage, also chair of our Government Affairs Committee. Uh, Jim, I know you're still doing a lot of work, a lot of legal work, but um, what, what are you seeing from clients right now? Well, after the initial close down, and by the way, good morning and welcome to the, the other uh, panelists on here with me and, and Garrett. Uh, initially, sort of mid-March, I saw still a lot of uh, commercial closings happening, sort of finishing up. We were getting used to the whole new remote notarization and signing of documents process. Uh, it, takes a little bit longer, but things were getting done. Then I started to see sort of that slack off. And most of the bank clients that I deal with have been really focused on processing the SBA federal government money coming through. So they sort of have refocused all of their departments, it seems, to try to process those, uh, those applications, many of which some of the clients on the business side need lawyer assistance. But for the majority, they're working with their bankers to try to go through through that process. So that seems to be the, the bulk of the activity happening right now. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have Lisa Zana with Shipman Goodwin and, and we appreciate you joining us, Lisa. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing from clients right now? Yeah, yeah we're, we're seeing, um, obviously, uh, big workouts uh, similar to, to what, what, what James just described. Um, you know, that some of the you know, more difficult ones that I think will take time to work out are, are some of, you know, things having to do with some of the CMBS lenders. Um, but, you know, we're trying, it, you know, to advise borrowers to be transparent, you know, kind of work with them and, and, and be patient with them. Um, you know, obviously, we're also seeing, you know, on, on both the landlord side and the tenant side, you know, workouts b between them, you know, in terms of, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's have some deferral of, of rents and, and some, some repayment plans. And, you know, they, they take all types of, um, depending on, on the situation, it takes all, all types of, of creative uh, solutions to those things. Um, you know, just just depending on the situation of the parties. Um, so yeah, we're we're seeing a lot of people working together. You know, on on both sides. So. Pat Naples with Shipman Goodwin. Um, I know you, your firm has also put together a, a white paper on on some of these issues as well. Yeah, and thanks, Garrett, for putting this together. And and I hope it can be helpful for everyone. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy out there right now. Um, yeah, we put together a white paper on force majeure clauses and possibility and practicability, right? Because almost from the outset, uh, one of the things that we started to see was a number of businesses questioning, what does this mean for our contracts? 
right? Leases, but all kinds of commercial contracts, right? We've got this clause that says force majeure, and it says if there's an act of God or a disaster, government regulation that interferes with our performance, we can cancel the contract. Does that mean we don't have a valid contract anymore, right? And then there are other legal doctrines um, that say if it's impossible to perform under the contract, that the contract may be canceled, right? And what is what does all of that mean? And, um, and that's come up in a variety of different contexts. And so we've been trying to field some of those questions. And um, I think most of that right now um, is still you know, in negotiation phases, if for no other reason, because the courts are moving at a snail's pace right now, if not totally closed in some instances. But uh, certainly a lot of that is starting to bubble over into real conflict between parties right now. Yeah, maybe we'll start there. Um, for all the lay people out there, could you explain what force majeure is? And uh, that's not the same for every contract, just if that term is in there. Yeah. So um, usually there will be a there may be a heading right that says force majeure, and the contract provision generally says something to the effect of if there's an act of God, a civil disaster, a flood, a government regulation or some other unforeseen event beyond the party's control, then the contract may be canceled, right? And, it, 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 and generally what it means, right, is if there's something that is some massive interruption, like COVID-19, right, that interferes with the party's ability to perform under their contract, you know, really in a way that nobody could have seen happening in advance, then it may allow uh, the cancellation of the contract. But there are some important things, I think, to keep in mind as you're looking at that provision, because like you said, Garrett, all of these clauses are different in little ways that can make a you know, substantial difference, right? So some of them say that you have to provide notice within so many days of the event. So for parties that are just looking at the clauses now, if it said you had to give notice a month ago, right, that might be a barrier to canceling the contract. Um, for others, right, you have to really look at when the performance is supposed to take place. You know? So if you have a contract that was supposed to be performed a month ago, well, COVID-19 might interfere with that. If performance isn't going to take place for another two years, right, it's a little harder to say that a force majeure event has occurred. Um, and then I think the final thing that parties really need to keep in mind here is that the event, right, that interferes with performance has to be beyond control of the parties. So what we've seen in some instances is, well, the part, one of the parties was having trouble performing under the contract before coronavirus, right? And now they're really having trouble performing under the contract. And they're trying to invoke that clause. And that's a little difficult, right? Because you could argue that really the trouble related to performance is not the fault of coronavirus, right? It was the fault of what was going on beforehand. So again, each is very different, but um, those, are some, those are some general things you wanna keep in mind. Jim, let me jump to you. And then I'll yeah, I just wanted to, to, um, to follow what Pat said. It, it's really important to look at the language of the clause. So make sure you get your lawyer the lease if they don't have it, because I've seen a lot of leases that say, um, you know, not so much you cancel the contract, but if you cannot perform an act, except for the payment of rent, they exclude right. that one, um, because of force majeure, which clearly COVID is, then you're excused from that act. But if the very aspect of the situation here is I can't pay my rent because whatever it is I do as a tenant, I, you know, I, I ship restaurant supplies out and the restaurants are closed, so I have nothing to do. Um, you know, that's their issue. The other thing I think, and, and Pat, I don't know if you're saying this is, if the tenant has applied for the payment, uh, the payroll protection grants, and if they've gotten it, a lot of the landlords are saying, well, then you have to pay me the rent. Well, the payment protection uh, loans slash, which become grants, cover a whole host of things, including payroll and other expenses. So what I've seen a lot of tenants doing is they're saying, okay, I'm gonna get, you know, uh, I'm gonna get $100 a week, just using the number, and of that 100, I'm gonna give you, the landlord, 50, and then, 50 is going to go over to my employees, et cetera, when I should have been giving you the landlord 70. So again, it gets back to, and I think all of us have said this, you need to have conversations and negotiations between the landlord and tenant because everybody's getting hurt at this situation and try to keep at least a relationship going 
um, as we get through this and make sure that you document it somehow, even if it's an email saying, I'm gonna pay you 50% of the rent, the landlord says, okay, that's fine. You need something, because when this all blows over, people forget <laughs> that they've made those agreements. No, I think Jim's absolutely right. I think that what you have, is, what, you have what all parties right should be keeping in mind here is that at every level of the business relationship, you have parties impacted, right? So the tenant, is impacted by the fact that they don't have the customer stream that they used to. The landlord is impacted because they're not getting the payments from the tenant that they used to be getting and from the neighboring tenants, right? And the lender is impacted because they're not getting the payments from the landlord, right? And so I think as all of this is concerned, rather than immediately moving to invoke the force majeure clause, cancel the contract, it's useful to see that even if you receive one of those letters, I think, as in sort of opening gesture in a negotiation. And most of what I've seen, right, is even in those instances in which the first letter that goes out might be strident, right, might just be aggressive. It's really an invitation to negotiate uh, between the two parties. And I think to Jim's initial point too, it's absolutely right that you wanna be careful about what your actual clause says, because it may not provide for termination. And even if it does, it may require liquidated damages. Right? There was a case in Connecticut from a few years back involving licenses, and it says if you cancel the licensing agreement, you can do so based on force majeure, but you're still liable for all the royalty payments. Right. So what's that? Right? What's really the value in canceling the contract anyway, even if you have force majeure? So you want to really be careful about those specifics. And Lisa, I know you want to jump in there. Yeah, yeah, and just in, in terms of leasing, um, it's always, a, I mean, it, James is right in that, um, you know, most leases, you know, that, that I think we've all seen will say, you know, that uh, force majeure will be, will allow a party to delay performance under a lease, but it usually then says, however, it doesn't delay any rental payments or other monetary obligations that are in the lease. However, it is always a good idea, especially if you're either a landlord or a tenant who has a lot of leases, um, to check, you know, whether that's true. Because, you know, if, if, you, if you review a survey of leases, sometimes, for whatever reason, the tenant may have, you know, had a good day, you know, when they negotiated that lease or they had a lot of leverage. And sometimes it doesn't carve out rent. And, and perhaps you can delay the payment of rent because of a force majeure, depending, you know, you have to look at that, that clause, obviously, very, very carefully. Um, you know, they don't usually allow you to cancel the lease, um, you know, but, uh, but you may be able to delay the performance. If you just entered into a lease and either the tenant or the landlord has, has performance obligations in terms of building out the space, a lot of times force majeure may apply to that, you know, the, you know, the landlord and whoever it is who has the obligation may be able to delay for some time. Sometimes there's caps on that, you know, like, the, you know, you could delay for maybe 120 days, something like that, but no more. Um, you know, it's, it's so definitely you, you want to check those clauses because sometimes you get lucky and some, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes they, they may, as Pat said, take you to a place that you may not have expected. So it's good to take a look. Um, you know, in, in the non-leasing arena, um, you know, I've, I've built out a lot of folks who've been in the event planning, you know, conferences and, and the, that sort of thing where, you know, uh, the venues there, it could conceivably be ready to go, but for that, you know, the governor of the state says you can't, you can't have more than 10 people in, in one place. And, you know, who's really going to get on the plane and come to these conferences? And, and so those force majeure clauses have become extremely important, um, you know, and probably once people get out of this and the courts open, I, I think there's going to be some, some, some of that in play because you're talking about millions of dollars of canceled conferences and and so on. So, um, you know, Matt, I, sorry, Matt, you can, you know, if, if you want, you can, you, you or James can get more into that perhaps of, you know, what, you know, what other items might come into play, you know, if people are going to bring those kind of uh, claims or defend them. Do you, do you guys feel like people are having, even having these conversations right now on a, a large scale 
basis or are they just uh, not sending in the rent and there, there's no communication going on? I mean, are, are, is there a lot of communication between landlords and tenants from what, what you're seeing? I, I'm seeing a lot of um, my my landlord clients are having the conversations with the tenants. The tenants have either approached them or they've approached the the, uh, the tenant because um, they know that the nature of their business is going to is shut down because of what's happening with, with the state. Uh, but a lot of my landlord clients are already the kind of landlords that are always in con you know consultation with their tenants and and work with their tenants to say, okay, if you can't afford the ten thousand square feet, I have enough flexibility in the properties I own that I can move you to a 8,000 or 5,000 and somebody else um, in that spot can jump in and take over the extra space. So th there's a lot of, and that's a landlord who's very hands-on. Um, but if you have a management company necessarily who is looking at just, you know, the income flow um, and the expenses, there may not be that kind of flexibility and communication going on because there's sort of that intermediary. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I right. and I would see. I, I would say that our, our clients are having that, you know, on both both sides, landlords, tenants, you know, event planners and event venues, and you know, and all sorts of, you know, they're they're having those conversations with us. You know, I think people are wanting to work with other people. They're not, you know, going out saying, you know, uh, you didn't pay my rent. I'm going to charge you the default interest and the mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this all right now just because you missed April, April 1. They're, they're trying to be cooperative because, you know, this isn't going to be forever. I mean, I know it seems like it is, but it's not. And, and we're going to get out of it. And so, you know, it, it's best for people to, to work with each other and kind of avoid the, the, the fireworks. Um, you know, and, and, and I've seen, you know, people you know people on the other side answer constructively like yes like 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 what james said you know we'll, we'll move you around maybe you know we'll let you add some term to your lease or you know in, in, in exchange for a deferral yeah, things things like that but then i have also seen where the bucks are, are are pretty large you know folks saying you know i don't think your force majeure clause is is relevant and doesn't apply even though it would seem on its face to clearly clearly be applicable. So, you know, they, there's some people that just have their, you know, kind of at least their, their I, I think because they're trying to def defend the flag in a lot of areas and may, maybe many states and they're so right now they're just saying, I, I'm not giving in to anybody just yet. So, yeah. it, you know, there's some of that too. It d depends on their situation. Yeah, I think generally, right, um, parties want to see the opening letters, right, as an invitation for negotiation, right? And that even in certain instances in which uh, you as a landlord, right, or as any contracting party gets a letter that says we're invoking the force majeure clause and, you know, ex reserving all rights there under, um, it's, you want to, at least at the outset, um, look at that as an invitation to negotiate, right? Because um, at worst, you're wrong and you're going to be fighting anyway, right? But at best, you at least have an opportunity to negotiate back and forth. And that's, I think, what we've seen or what I've seen um, from a lot of parties is it may start with a letter from one party's lawyer to the other saying, we're invoking force majeure, this is a force majeure event, and that's it, versus, um, uh, but then the other the parties continue to engage in negotiation after that. And I think you know it's important to keep those lines of communication open for that very reason. Um, we, you know, we the governor has uh, put out some um, exemptions for residential tenants. I've heard of some people trying to apply that from a, a commercial standpoint. Um, but I know we we have some uh, people probably on the line who own apartment buildings, uh, maybe dealing with tenants. Um, you know, my understanding from some of the governor's proclamations is you know, uh, restricting evictions for uh, some period of time, maybe into July, uh, but also even allowing for renters to not make payments um, in April and May. Um, <clears throat> that puts landlords in a difficult situation, uh, but have you heard anything on that and, and how that plays out? Yeah, I mean, it, it, in, in terms of, you know, with, 
the multifamily arena, um, you know, the, I think many, I, w I would say I've, I've heard a lot of things depending on what state you're in, whether it's Connecticut or New York, um, that about 50% of the people roughly paid, um, you know, their, their April rent and, you know, who know, we don't know what's going to happen in May and June, but you know, in Connecticut, New York for about 90 days, you can't, you know, you can't evict them um, or, you know, or take, take those sorts of actions against them. Um, you know, and I think a landlord, e even if that didn't, wasn't the case, a landlord who would do that, I think is not, you know, it's not going to do well in the press or, or anywhere else um, with this. But uh, yeah, I think they have to be, you know, transparent with their lenders, you know, their lenders know, you know, what type of asset this is and, um, you know, and, and just try try to work with them and, and get through it. I mean, in, in many cases, they have federal lenders, you know, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, mm -hmm. um, which is which is good because the, I would imagine that, <laughs> you know, if the, if the administration is somewhat <laughs> coherent and that's, you know, a big question, but, um, you know, the, the, those, lenders are not going to be ones that that are going to fight to you know to be paid on their debt service you know immediately so um you know I hope, james have you have you um seen anything in that in that arena well i think what i've seen is that um and, and as you know here in connecticut both residential and commercial evictions are all in the same court so um at, at some point when the courts reopen they're all going to be in the same spot and and i i historically have not seen a lot of judges in those courts who, if a tenant comes in, you know, residential or, or commercial, who comes in and says, look, this is the situation, um, they are pretty sympathetic about giving time for the tenant, if they're willing, to try to catch up. Uh, so if it's a commercial tenant that might be getting the, you know, the payment protection plan, and they say, look, I paid 50% of the rent during these three months, I'll try to catch up. I would suspect that they're going to give them time to do that. Um, and you know the landlord could say no, I, I don't want to do that. That's their right under the lease. But you know it's it's what the court's going to do, and you have to sort of appeal from there. Um, I do think though that you're right that the banks, you know, the landlords tend to turn to the banks, and they they are working with the banks to try to deal with this. Um, most of the banks that I deal with, even before some of the uh, federal programs came out, were working on sort of internal forbearance agreements where they were looking at sort of on their own doing 60, 90 day forbearance. Um, Often, most of them were saying they were not going to charge interest on the outstanding principal during that time period. Uh, the payment would be due, obviously, at some point at the end, maybe as a balloon at the end, or maybe they'd structure to pay when things change. But uh, they were already, many of the lenders were already starting down that road before we saw the federal and state programs kick in. The only thing I would add is, I think, yeah, the only thing I'd add here is that and I think this is sort of a through line throughout our, our conversation today, which is the importance of thinking in terms of a negotiated resolution, thinking creatively, thinking about the long term, right? Um, so if you're a, you know, if you own multifamily, you might want to think in advance, in addition to talking to your lender, about talking to your tenants about ways to make the payment of rent easier, right? If you require the payment of rent in one way, right? Maybe now's the time to consider whether you'll accept payment of rent in a different way, right? If you only take it via, you know, hard check, you might want to think about taking it electronically, right? Or vice versa. Um, and trying to ensure that what you are not doing is not getting any cash coming in the door. And then on the back end, hoping at the end of the lease that you're going to be able to collect two months of rent that weren't paid during the coronavirus when your tenants were out of work, right? I mean, that's just... Because that's going to be a that's going to be a tough situation, right? Mm -hmm. Just it's going to be both tough and expensive, frankly, um, to try to do that. And so I think it's really important, and this is true for all businesses, but for multifamily too, to think about what can be done to try to minimize the damage that this outbreak is you know, wreaking on um, specific sectors and industries. Yeah, and that's a good point because if you're going uh, after a couple of months of rent a year from now, uh, the costs versus trying to collect that from maybe even a business that's not around anymore, um, it, you're just not going to get back what, you, what you're expecting.
Yeah, I mean, it's true for both commercial and residential, right? I mean, you know, we're thinking about collecting, you know, back rent from an individual tenant, right? Obviously, administratively, that's, that's a nightmare. But even for, you know, an individual commercial tenant, right, if they are no longer in the property, um, and you're trying to collect one month's rent from a year and a half ago, that's going to be a, it's going to be a tough, tough road to haul. And again, may not be worth it from a financial perspective to even go that route. Right. And, and when you're dealing with the commercial tenants, you know, sometimes as a landlord, you have to sort of, uh, sort of appraise their business and think about it a little bit. You know, if you're going to, you know, defer, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of rent, um, you know, what is the likelihood that they will be successful, you know, six months, 12 months from now? Um, you know, there's some there's some businesses that, that you can see that, yes, you know, we're going to come out of this and, and they'll be okay. But there's some that, you know, you it, it's clear that they may have problems, you know, for years down the road, unfortunately. Um, and, and I hope I'm, you know, in, when we're doing that, we're being pessimistic and I hope it doesn't happen. But, um, you know, then you kind of have to say, okay, well, what, what sort of security deposit do I have? If I have a letter of credit, that's great because mm -hmm. even if they filed for bankruptcy, that would not be part of the debtor's estate and that's helpful and that might be something I can draw down on when they continue to have problems six months, a year from now. Um, and then, you know, and if you have cash, well, that's good, um, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not the best. And, and there's also, you know, you could maybe play with the security deposit a little bit. Okay, well, we'll apply that for now, you know, or a portion of it, you know, while this, this thing is going on. So, you know, that's, um, yeah, it, it, you just gotta, yeah, think about that going forward too. One, one more thing before we maybe jump to questions, uh, that mm -hmm. from the landlord side, if you're a landlord that has a multi-tenanted business, uh, what are your obligations and are you meeting them? So when you take the position with the tenant, look, I want all my rent or I want my rent over time or whatever arrangement you come to. If you're a shopping center, if you're a mall, um, if you're a strip center, um, you know, shopping strip center, you may have obligations that stem from a certain percentage of those spaces have to be occupied. Well, they may be occupied, but if they're not open, um, then if I'm a small retail tenant in a large, large place that has big department stores that are right now shut, um, you know, how's that impacting me? I mean, you're supposed to be having these places uh, with the assumption that they're all open. And yes, they're occupied by that tenant, but they're not open. So where's that kick in in terms of the tenant's obligation as well? Right. So just just keep that in mind when, if you're representing a landlord or if you are a landlord, you know, what are your obligations for the tenants that are there? Uh, you have a building and you say, we have a athletic facility and you happen to have a, you know, one of the commercial athletic facilities. Are they open? No, they're all closed. So does that somehow impact your tenants? They can't go use the gym in their building anymore. Um, again, it, it's not going to be any, any kind of perfect solution, but just think about that as you work towards your negotiations. Uh, we, we do have a uh, <clears throat> more of a comment here, uh, Michael Schaefer, um, C.A. White, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Michael and I have talked about this a lot, but uh, Michael said here, residential tenants have actually been paying at a higher level uh, than 50%, while commercial tenants are more in that 50% range. Um, it's been some confused messaging from the governor's office is uh, what Michael's been concerned about, um, tenants having the impression that they have a pass on rental payments. Um, while many of them do actually have the cash to pay. Uh, and what Michael suggested here is that some landlords are actually extending the leases. And, and I do think, it, you know, this is kind of gets at what we were just talking about, that rent is due. Everything that's been out there has been about delaying payments or not getting evicted. But uh, no one has, unless you've come to an agreement with your landlord, um, completely abolished that rent because, as we mentioned here, it's a whole chain the landlord or the owner of the property has a banking a relationship, has a, has a lender uh, that they're responsible to. The banks obviously uh, are running a business as well. And so it goes up and down the chain. And anyone wanna just comment on that? And let me, uh, as I throw that out there too, say uh, one thing I think we're all seeing in the economy is uh, because there's so much unknown and uncertainty Everyone, even if you have cash, you're kind of hanging on to it right now because you're not sure what's next. Um, but there obviously are a lot of people who have the money to make payments and, and kind of in doing that, they actually 
you know, it's a cascading effect on, negatively on the economy uh, that payments aren't being made. And, and I'm sure that that's something that, you know, a lot of landlords are seeing. They see companies that do have cash. They're just choosing not to spend it right now. Right. Um, the, what, what we've seen is, you know, when we, if there's a landlord that has a few tenants um, or, or, or the manpower to sort of talk to each tenant, because some do have that, and they'll, they'll go and they'll, you know, they kind of ask them, okay, what, you know, what is your financial situation? You know, have you applied for the PPP loan and all of that, and then sort of make a deal with them based on that. But then we've also seen, you know, landlords that have so many tenants that you, you know, you, it, the manpower to do that kind of thing just isn't feasible. And so then they're sort of saying, okay, here's what we're offering, you know, and they'll kind of, it, it'll sort of be one size fits all. And maybe you, you carve out some tenants from that because maybe, maybe it's, it's too much, but, you know, it, and so we, we've seen like sort of blanket letters that go out and say, you know, here's what we're offering. And, you know, and then the tenants can respond, you know, or not. So, um, you know, I guess it depends on, you know, your ability to find out from each tenant uh, their, you know, whether they can pay or not. Um, kind of on a, another topic, um, and, and Jim, I think you touched on this a little bit at the open, but uh, closings are occurring for, for property deals that are out there, but uh, at a much slower rate. Is, is that the best way to, to capture it? I, I know from uh, some of my colleagues that do a lot of residential closings that the residential closings are moving forward because the people are locked into their contracts. Um, their, their mortgage contingency and their inspection contingencies all lapsed uh, or in fact were, were already met before it all hit. And uh, you know, the sellers are saying, you know, they're pressing and saying, look, you're going to lose your deposit unless you, uh, unless you close. And so the buyers are sort of, feeling compelled to close because they don't want to lose their deposits. Um, the sellers are also concerned that will there be another buyer? If I, if I let this buyer go, will there be another buyer? So uh, there's those closings are going on. Some of the attorneys I know are, are especially some of the solo guys are being pretty um, um, creative about how they, how they move papers around um, all trying to be safe. But uh, it, it's more of a challenge just because the documents that we typically will use in a closing need to be notarized or signed um, before a commissioner's fair court. Uh, they've eliminated having to have witnesses, which has really helped for the time being. Um, but you have to have certain formalities with the documents in order to get them uh, in a recordable form for the town clerks. And then you're dealing with the town clerks, which are all pretty much closed to the public. Uh, they have drop off boxes or your, or your uh, title search providers and um, recording providers can at least get the stuff to them and it'll be a delay in getting the recording information. You know, some towns are better than others in terms of the, uh, the ability to move things um, electronically as well. It's just, it sort of varies from town to town. Uh, but for instance, I had to do a search, uh, sort of a research search on a piece of property that had to go back beyond what's available online. So I had to make an appointment with the town clerk, happened to be in my town of Brantford. I had to make an appointment with the town clerk when I could go into the vault, just me wearing my mask and my gloves. They clean the vault before I go in. I go in there, I can spend as much time as I want and then I leave. But you know, it's, it's cumbersome. It's cumbersome for them, it's cumbersome for me um, to do that. And, that. and that might apply if you have a closing that has to go back and track something before most places I think are, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like 1990s or 1980s is when most of the, the records are online. So before that, um, you have to sort of get into the, get into the books. Um, you know, we had one question here and I can start to answer this. And then if you guys have some comment on it, um, aren't landlords getting the same loans on their properties to cover their losses? I, I think referring here uh, to maybe like the paycheck protection program. Um, what I can say about that is <clears throat> paycheck protection program is what it sounds like. It's really based off of payroll. Uh, so it's not based off of your other incomes. Um, so, for instance, a business uh, wants to get that loan turned into a grant, as long as 75% of what you have there is going towards your payroll for your employees, that portion can be uh, forgiven. And then the other 25%, this is kind of what Jim was talking about, can go towards rent and utilities to include internet, electric, uh, things like that. So, uh, when you apply that to kind of the uh, real estate uh, firm, uh, you know, business that owns a lot of 
real estate, you know, they may have some employees, uh, but that obviously doesn't cover the income that they count on uh, from uh, real estate leases. Mm -hmm. Did I cover that uh, correctly? Right, right. Um, a lot of a lot of the businesses we're helping, um, you know, real estate businesses, developers especially, they don't have a lot of payroll, and and the the PPP loan is two and a half times the monthly payroll. And if you don't have a lot, then you're not getting much of a loan. Um, we also are running into that many um, uh, of these these developers and, and so on may be owned by hedge funds and and other other type of funds or even foreign funds and to the extent that the, that they are aggregated with those funds, which they often are, they're not eligible anymore because then all of a sudden they have more than 500 employees, even though they're kind of, you know, more or less an independent business, but um, they're ultimately owned by, by a fund. So that, that sometimes that disqualifies, disqualifies them. So. Great. Well, um, I'm not seeing many other questions here. If anyone wants to throw one up, uh, we can take that. But um, I'll go to our panel for kind of a, a just last comment. Um, either, you know, other issues people should be concerned about going forward uh, or best ways, uh, in your opinion, to kind of navigate uh, the, the treacherous uh, roadmap that's out there uh, for dealing with contracts going forward. So, um, Pat, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. So, Again, I think one of the things that has come through throughout this is the importance of trying to negotiate and trying to come to a solution here, right? And, and I think um, one of the things that I've seen and thought about as this has been going on is, you know, we've talked a lot about force majeure clauses and about what your contract may say specifically, but just because you're rock solid under the language of your contract doesn't necessarily mean there aren't legal doctrines, right? Like impossibility, impracticability, frustration of purpose, right? These are sort of common law doctrines that can be invoked by parties that may uh, entitle them to some relief under the contract, but it isn't specifically in the language of the contract. So all of that is to say right now, um, the importance of trying to, devoid, uh, trying to avoid a drawn out battle over issues like that in court um, and trying instead to uh, work towards a solution that makes sense for everyone and avoids, you know, uh, massive uh, litigation and administrative costs along the way. Lisa? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I echo what, what Pat said, um, you know, what we've gone into more detail, um, you know, in that white paper, which I, I think can be available to, you know, to anyone who likes it. it's also on our, on our, um, on our website. Um, but it, it kind of goes into some of the, the cases, the case law that that's been, you know, that's been litigated in the past to sort of, you know, so you can sort of guess at, at the type of, um, uh, um, you know, the, you know, whether or not your case would be good or not. And, you know, obviously, you know, a, a, any one of us can help, you know, help, help folks decide that whether they would have a good case or not. Um, you know, but I, I think it, it's more of a sort of a point of leverage, at least at this point for the negotiation to say, you know, I have a good force majeure defense or an impracticability or an impossibility defense. Um, so, you know, I, I think you, I think we need to, to talk and, and, and avoid a litigation, but, you know, it, three months, six months, 12 months from now, you know, you may, we, you may have to get into it, depending on how much money is at stake. Jim? I, I would say a couple things. First off, make sure uh, you go back and look at your contract or your lease or whatever legal document is, is uh, in place between the relationship between you and, and the person that you're having the issue with, whether it's your landlord or your tenant, your buyer, your seller, your lender, that's the first thing to go to. I agree with, with, with Lisa and Pat that negotiation is the better way to go. Um, I've seen in the past that you can have documents that say all kinds of things and you need a court to enforce it. Um, you can think of commercial documents that give the uh, lender secured party lots of rights, but you can't breach the peace. So you can't break into the store and take back your equipment and things like that. So, you know, language says one thing and then there's the practicality of it. Um, so, and, and then, and then a shameless, a shameless uh, 
promo. If you have questions, uh, hallerandsage.com. We have lots of things on our website. We've been doing uh, lots of, of client alerts and uh, we have a lot of different attorneys that hold um, sort of uh, focus in a lot of different areas. So um, we're here to help if you want, if you need, need help. I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I think what we're trying to get across is that uh, even in this situation, we are still uh, regulated by contracts, the contracts that all of our businesses are in. And so uh, it's really important that you read that fine language, talk with your attorney. Uh, negotiation is the best pathway. I did see a, a follow up here on the <clears throat> question about PPP, and that's the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, asking if the economic injury disaster loans apply to landlords, and they do. Um, that is just another loan, though. So that's uh, there is a very small grant portion, up to ten thousand dollars can become a grant, uh, but otherwise, <clears throat> it's another loan. So that may even, in and of itself, um, interfere with some of the the loans that a landlord already has. Um, I, you know, I think that overall the stimulus. Uh, packages are trying to keep economic activity going on. Um, and so, you know, we're not trying to be just pro landlord here or pro tenant, but the idea is that, you know, whether it's rent payments or payments to your employees or payments to your suppliers and, and ultimately that you have customers coming back in, that this activity continues overall because it, it is an entire system. And, and as we said, um, e even just the rent hits on multiple levels and brings in multiple different uh, people who are involved in that process. So I want to thank our panelists again. Uh, definitely thank Haller and Sage and Shipman and Goodwin for supporting the chamber, but also uh, providing uh, the three of you to be able to uh, share the knowledge you have with our membership. So thank you very much. And everyone have a great day. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Nice to see you guys.